Hi. Hi, uh, Leon. Uh, welcome to Reality Check. Uh, Thank you. My guest today is uh, Bidru Krishnan, who is the um, enterprise architect for uh, over 10 years. And the reason I invited Bidru is because he has the title that um, I never heard before. Uh, he is becoming AI ethic assessor. And today, uh, Bidru and I uh, will uh, will discuss the ethics, uh, the ethical use of AI. Uh, the subject is new to me, and uh, I am so eager to learn what's the ethical way of using uh, uh, generative AI. But before we dive into our topic today, uh, Bidru, uh, can you introduce yourself um, and tell us uh, how did you get to become uh, on the path of ethical use of uh, AI and assessor. Yeah, hi, Ilya. So first of all, thanks for inviting me to the podcast or the video cast, as I might call it. And I've been watching the first few episodes of your uh, podcast and they were really interesting. I've learned a lot. So I'm happy to contribute now uh, on, and be on the other side of sharing what I have learned in the past months and years. And a little bit about myself. My name is Biju, and uh, I live in Munich, uh, just like Ilya, perhaps closer to the city center than Ilya, but uh, same city. Uh, and yeah, as Ilya mentioned, like I've been in the business of, uh, let's say, designing solutions for different kind of technologies for the last 20 years, actually. Uh, but the last 10 years have been uh, focused on analytics, big data. And uh, like in the past few years, I have also been very, very focused on AI and machine learning. Uh, and in the past year, uh, I got uh, a bit thoughtful about the implications of uh, AI in on our daily lives. Uh, and then I've, uh, I started to go on this venture of uh, learning more about uh, how we can incorporate ethical principles into not only developing AI applications, but also uh, from the aspect of how do we maintain those principles uh, when we are uh, in the operations mode uh, for those applications. So uh, my goal is to bring my practical experience, which I have in deploying AI applications and then combining it with, uh, let's say, the ethical values that we uh, as a society should aspire to upkeep uh, when we go on this journey of uh, augmenting our lives with artificial intelligence. So that's like a quick summary of uh, myself. Great, thank you. Before we jump into the uh, topic, let me ask you this. What's your view on the future of AI? So how do you see generative AI uh, going to change our lives going forward? Yeah, so I currently work for an organization or a company called Nordaria. Uh, and the, this is a SAP consultancy and they hired me to find ways of increasing the productivity of uh, like you know, end users or SAP consultants. And I found that very exciting because, and that's the North Star of our company now that we are gonna find ways using AI, Gen AI, whichever is more suitable uh, to increase the productivity of uh, our users, our consultants and um, and uh, use AI as a, as a force to augment their skills and their knowledge. And I believe that every organization should do the same is to define a North Star uh, because there could be like hundreds and thousands of applications of AI, but uh, it's very hard for uh, an organization uh, to focus on all those areas. So my goal is always to narrow it down and stay focused. And right now the goal is to improve productivity of people using AI and Gen AI. Okay, so you see AI as the people productivity tool rather than a replacement of human workers with uh, digital employees. Yeah, so like there was a study done with BCG consultants. So BCG created this uh, study with 700 or 800 of their staff. Uh, and they created like a real use case where they uh, asked their consultants to use AI to you know, test their productivity. And they, they saw that there were two types of consultants. One type of consultants, they tried to use AI as a co-pilot. Uh, and they were very successful in what they did. Uh, like they achieved like 40% higher quality in their results. Whereas there were some consultants who tried to use AI as an automated 
agent, like, you know, to make it do everything that they would have done. And then the, the success rate was uh, much lower. I think it was around 12% or so. So I also see that it's not like AI replacing humans at the moment. It's more of like AI plus humans and, and achieving higher productivity this, with this combination. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let's talk about ethics. So why do we need to consider ethics when we are implementing AI solutions? So why is it important? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there are some principles, like, as I mentioned before, like, uh, we as a society aspire to uphold some principles, right? So uh, in our daily lives, and the question is, like, uh, whether we can do that still uh, with the help, even when this powerful technology is, say, let's say, ingrained in our um, uh, in our work or our daily lives, which we think, which I believe is the case right now. Uh, and so, like, uh, that's why ethical AI is so important. Uh, and the, some of the principles like which we should uh, consider when we develop AI systems are, for example, like ensuring that individuals are aware of the fact that uh, uh, AI uh, system is involved in the process of making decisions, for example. So uh, we have to inform these users that such a such an act is taking place. And so that's falls under the category of transparency. And that's the uh, the ideal or the value that we're trying to uphold in this case. Uh, then we have the case of, uh, let's say, ensuring that the results that come out of this AI system are accurate uh, and they are consistent. So that's that those, the values that we uphold then are explainability, uh, repeatability, and reproducibility. Like So these are the three values that we try to uphold then. And then we have the fact that uh, we need to, or the principle that we need to uphold is that we should make the AI system function reliably and make sure that it doesn't cause harm to the individual that is interacting with it. And this is especially true in the case of children, for example, where, you know, AI might get embedded into toys or, you know, maybe the children are already used to talking to Alexa or Siri. You know, how do we make absolutely <laughs> sure that uh, those things do not harm our children. So uh, making the AI system reliable is of utmost uh, priority for, or should be our utmost priority. And then these, the values that, uh, let's say, encompass this uh, activity, you know, they fall under safety, security, and robustness. Number four is like ensuring that AI does not unintention unintentionally discriminate, right? So uh, resume scanning applications, you know, these are, prevalent nowadays and how do we ensure that a certain class of people you know maybe they have a specific last name and the ai has come to a conclusion that this last name uh, or type of last name is uh, kind of not suitable for the company we don't know like there are always hidden biases in in these algorithms and data sets so ensuring that ai does not unintentionally discriminate is uh, is super important and then this falls under the category of fairness uh, and then the last one is like ensuring human accountability and control. So I presented us a, a solution where, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we are targeting productivity increase. And I, in the in the slide deck, I, I put a human element to the uh, to the application. And my customer asked, "Why do you 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 said these are all automated uh, workflows? Why do you need a human in this slide?" And I told him that. Uh, from the responsible AI guidelines and the principles, I know it's very important that we don't imagine uh, or yet imagine workflows that are totally autonomous. There will be always a need for humans to intervene. And um, if you are selling a solution that uh, advertises otherwise, uh, then it's kind of misleading. So, and that also goes with autonomous driving cars. I mean, you see that uh, certain car companies are advertising their cars as self-driving already, which is kind of misleading. And then uh, if humans buy into this concept, then, uh, you know, we end up with accidents. So I think that's like the, like those are the four or five principles that uh, that we need to upkeep in all our AI develop, development of AI systems uh, efforts. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned scenario uh, where uh, there are CVs sent uh, for a review, and then we need to make sure that AI that reads through the CVs will not discriminate. Uh, 
Uh, I wonder if today we measure uh, whether the real people that reads the CVs are actually doing discrimination or not. And we want AI to be better than us. Um, uh, um, interesting observation. Yeah, so, I mean, we know that we, we all have biases and um, and definitely there are biases uh, in the society. Uh, for example, in a certain country, I wouldn't name countries or companies, but uh, this was a, a very uh, a famous uh, example where uh, I used to live in a certain country and in this country, they made a resume with three different last names and they saw that the same resume like had a different effect on the uh, application process, right? So. Uh, we have those biases. The problem with um, uh, like why we are having increased scrutiny on AI is because uh, we believe that the, these biases will be amplified, let's say, 10 times, 100 times uh, when you do it uh, through an automated process. And uh, the biases will be so uh, amplified. And, uh, uh, and the other, other side is that they will also be very hidden inside these algorithms and data sets. Uh, it will be very hard for us to pinpoint why uh, a certain class of people are being excluded. So with a human, it's easier. You can say, oh, you know, it's very transparent. You can hear it from the other person and see, okay, maybe this person is already discriminating. But when it comes to an autonomous system or an AI system, it'll be hard for you to find out why there is discrimination. I'm curious, uh, when we are talking about ethics and AI, which ethics are we talking about? Is there a human ethic that we want to use or there's a something special AI ethics um, that we need to think about and discover? Yeah, like just for the purposes of uh, having a structured assessment, we have codified these ethical values. So they are not something new, like, I mean, they are the same. Uh, like values that we should aspire to have. But of course, for the sake of, let's say, uh, having a structured scientific process of assessing a system, uh, I think I mentioned it already, we have values like transparency, which you know, we have discussed, and then explainability, um, safety, security, robustness, fairness. So we have like, for example, the uh, certification process that I am recommending companies to adopt is called the IEEE certified uh, process. And then they have ontological specifications for each of these values that I mentioned. Uh, and so the idea is to assess a system based on certain ontological specifications uh, for these values. So yeah, I mean, they are not different from human values, but um, yeah, we, we have sort of limited them and structured them to make the assessment more uh, productive. So we have 10 commandments. Robots have three laws. Are we going to have 100 commandments for AI? Yeah, I think you're talking about Asimov's. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes. And yeah. No, I mean, uh, no, we don't, we, as I said, like right now, the ontological specification, at least for IEEE certified, is just five pillars. Um, yeah, I mean, we might see additional pillars come up as, you know, maybe AI, as they say, may move into AGI or super AI. I mean, we don't know what the future holds, right? So uh, we might need to imagine uh, the other values, which we haven't thought about uh, ever, where the robot is governing us. I mean, this is, again, a very utopian or dystopian version of AI. But um, yeah, I, I, will, I couldn't say that it, the, the, on the specifications will be always limited to these five. Cool. So let, let's talk about the, how this ethics is uh, going to be enforced and what's happening in the companies um, when they're thinking about the ethical use of AI. Do, do companies think about ethical use of AI today? Yeah, it's, it's not that often. I have seen that they have a dedicated department. Uh, so there are two, two sides to this. One is that um, there are industries where uh, the, the, the needs no new law for enforcing ethics. There are already existing laws or existing standards uh, which, got, which are already enforcing ethical principles uh, in their products, right? So a pharma industry, for example, is one. Uh, healthcare pharma, they, they they already have standards. The toys, for example, there need there need not be a new law for governing 
um, ethics in these applications. Uh, they already have a scrutiny process. They already have certain norms and, uh, and standards which the companies or the organizations have to follow. So for them, there is no new law needed. But then you need something new because AI is going to be much more pervasive and much more um, uh, present in our daily lives. So in for in that, in order to like prevent misuse or prevent uh, any accidental uh, fallout out of uh, applying these technologies, uh, the, our legislators are let's say thinking about creating new laws or new frameworks, uh, which will then try to cover aspects which we have never thought about uh, in the past, and. Coming back to the question whether companies are considering ethical aspects, uh, there are, I mean, the large companies especially. So if you look at Microsoft, I mean, um, they have their responsible AI guidelines. And then you can see these guidelines uh, adopted in each of their services and products, right? So uh, for example, if you are interacting with a chatbot that is produced by or served by Microsoft, you will very often see, or even chat GPT for that matter, has a very clear notification at the bottom saying the chat chat bot can make mistakes and you shouldn't rely on it. You know, it's also these simple things that um, let's say add to the, uh, the fact that responsible AI is involved in serving these products. So yeah, but uh, also I have, uh, during my work, I have interacted with let's say over 200 customers in my uh, career. Um, who are trying to develop AI systems. And I would say a very small percentage of these uh, companies actually had a, a separate department, which was um, like uh, dedicated to ensuring like uh, responsible AI. So if you are a company that's thinking or starting to deploy uh, generative AI in their work, what steps would you recommend them to make uh, in order to be uh, to secure their future compliance. Yeah, so I have two two sets of recommendations. One is at the organizational level, and the other is at the use case level. So at the organizational level, I always recommend. Might sound like cliche, but uh, I think the leadership needs to sit sit down and and craft or draft their responsible AI guidelines. Right. So. I mean, at least they need to tell the vision to their uh, the colleagues as to how they want um, AI to be responsible in their organization. And all the large organizations have come up with their responsible AI guidelines. And first, you need to publish that internally for your uh, colleagues to or your employees to uh, grasp. But then you also need to publish those guidelines externally so that your consumers know that you're not developing systems that are, let's say, um, you know, uh, in with uh, at least with the intent of causing harm. So um, that's like one of the easiest things to do. Uh, there is also the the aspect of educating your users on what AI can do and cannot do, because uh, one of the aspects of responsible AI is not to try and squeeze in AI into every project that you have. So the more you educate your users into like what is possible and what is not possible, more importantly, I think that's kind of uh, also useful. Um, and then, you know, like I've uh, mentioned this uh, in the past in some of my talks, uh, companies like SAP have a very structured process uh, as to identifying high risk use cases and then referring them to um, a set of, um, uh, how do we call this, uh, like a, a group of people who are not really from that domain, but you know, multi, uh, multi, how do you call this? Multifaceted uh, skill sets, you know, like so. They they have a committee which uh, reviews projects um, from different perspectives, uh, especially if they considered high risk. And then there is a process as to uh, in identifying if that use case should go forward or not. So. Setting up these kind of uh, processes and organizations inside the company, especially if you're a large company, uh, can be very useful. Uh, on the use case side, you need to have a use case registry because today there might be hundreds of projects happening in your company that you're not even aware of. So if you're not aware of the projects or the use cases that are being um, developed, how would you even know if they are high risk or low risk or um, you know if they need scrutiny? So, Creating a registry is uh, really uh, a good thing to start with. And you can start 
making a registry just with an Excel file on SharePoint. Uh, but uh, there are, of course, tools available that can help you centralize your uh, AI use case registry as well. So that's one. And then uh, during the development of the product or the use case, um, you need to kind of conduct um, uh, ethical profiling exercise, which again has certain tools that you would need. I mean, so th there's a long process in there as well. So once you have the use case that is identified uh, as having risk, or maybe even to find out the risk level, you need to do ethical profiling. And once the ethical profiling is done, then uh, if you identify it as a high risk use case, then you need to follow also certain um, processes to uh, make sure that you have uh, covered all kinds of aspects that might cause harm or you know might cause damage uh, to the user or maybe to the reputation of your company. So uh, in that scenario, I would recommend that you uh, involve an assessor uh, and try to get this use case certified so that uh, all kinds of uh, aspects, all kinds of risks are then evaluated before this use case goes live. So yeah, okay. those... those Let's so uh, uh, this is very interesting. Let's dive a little bit deeper because uh, I can imagine that I, if I ask today uh, the management of the company, so can you publish the guidelines for using for ethical use of uh, AI? They'll be puzzled. They have never done anything like that before. And since AI will be touching pretty much every aspect of the business from customer relations, hiring, technical support, product development, sales process, document writing, uh, and data analytics. So everywhere we'll go to have use cases related to the use of Gen AI. Now, uh, who is going to help them? Are there companies that, that can hold their hand and guide them through the whole process? Uh, are the um, AI ethic assessors um, this this people, or are there companies that do the professionally AI ethic assessment? Yeah, like um, not so many, I would say, but of course there are lots of experts out there who are AI ethicists, um, and many of the large companies now have an official uh, responsible AI uh, officer, or they have. Uh, uh, you know, chief AI ethics officer uh, who are who are kind of very experienced, not just in AI ethics, but sometimes they have evolved from being um, people who were responsible for governing uh, data ethics. Uh, you know, like what kind of data would you collect, etc. That was also a topic of discussion. Uh, let's say once GDPR had been um, officially ratified, so. You, you will see that at least the large companies have dedicated team and dedicated uh, officers. Um, and this also sets the accountability in place because if AI is to cause harm or is, is set to cause any kind of damage, uh, then it's not the AI that's responsible, it's gonna be human. So um, one thing that your organization needs to also do is set up the accountability chart. Uh, and, and that goes all the way from, let's say, who is accountable for a certain use case to who is accountable for that uh, damage or uh, harm that is caused by your system at the whole organization level. And that could be your uh, chief AI ethics officer or it could be even your chief executive officer, for example. So um, that's again an aspect, but yeah, not it's the whole field is at a very nascent stage right now. Um, there are a few certifying authorities or certifying frameworks like IEEE one I mentioned, which is, I think one of the most mature ones right now, but I would be, uh, I mean, I would not be accurate if I said that this field is super mature. I think it's evolving. And uh, as we see AI being part of our lives more and more, I think the need for this kind of uh, evaluation and services will grow and uh, more. there will be more and more uh, need for uh, AI ethicists in the industry as such. Now, uh, you touched on that briefly, but I want to have a consistent discussion, structured discussions on the following subject. Uh, the ethics is such a philosophical uh, topic. At the same time, we want to understand whether we are ethical in our use of AI, not ethical. Um, so is it 
binary? We are ethical versus not ethical? Is it gradation? We are very ethical, not very ethical, um, not ethical at all? Or um, is there a number that we can calculate that shows the how, mu how much ethical are we in our use of AI? Good question. So first of all, uh, you know that there are these, um, in the EU AI Act, the proposed act, there are the gradation of, uh, there are three or four levels now. This These levels keep changing, but uh, let's assume there are three levels for now. Um, the low risk applications, and they have clearly said what low risk applications look like, um, which, for example, spam filtering or music recommendations. I mean, they, they are low risk uh, because they are not, uh, let's say, uh, they don't have any risk on our fundamental rights or um, they are not... Uh, having much of a, um, let's say, or no, no impact on uh, discrimination, et cetera. So th that's like considered as low risk and you don't need to worry about developing those systems. Uh, there is no regulation coming uh, to, uh, to, to kind of, um, um, to govern these kind of applications. Then you have medium risk or, um, or actually you have now high risk applications, which are, for example, uh, you know, they are okay if they are controlled, uh, but if they are not controlled, then they can cause discrimination. So resume scanning is actually part of high risk, or that could be also like admission, uh, college admission uh, scanning, for example, because if these applications uh, have a, a deep bias, uh, then they can deny opportunities to people uh, that affects their fundamental rights. So that's where that's why uh, these applications will be called high risk applications. And it's also applicable to um, AI applications that will govern or they, that will control critical systems. So for example, if there's a power grid and you're placing a model uh, to regulate uh, certain things in the power grid, then this also becomes a high risk application. Uh, and there are a host of other like categories, uh, like most of the public sector um, like uh, use cases, they will need some kind of scrutiny because uh, when you talk about um, a public service that is catering to citizens, uh, even if it's a classification of, uh, let's say, support tickets uh, by a government agency, uh, we have to ensure that, uh, whether th that application uh, could maybe, you know, uh, unintentionally discriminate uh, the citizens. So, yeah, so those high risk applications are also categorized. There are some guidelines to be uh, to to uh, to see if your application falls in that category. And then you have the prohibited applications. And currently, there are two types of applications that are prohibited. One is social scoring, and the other is uh, biometric scanning or biometric identification in public spaces. So it's very clear, like what kind of use case falls in what category, uh, at least from the examples. And if it's not clear, then you have to uh, undergo the process of ethical profiling. Uh, and when we do ethical profiling, what we do is uh, we actually, it's a very, uh, not a very, let's say, it's not just pure science, but it's also a matter of gathering perspectives from different people on how this um, application will work in the real world. Um, and then using that perspective um, to, to judge if uh, just the risk of this application. So it's not a super, let's say, a structured process, but at least there are some tools available to, to judge uh, the risk and the, uh, the nature of the risk. And once you have de defined the risk and the nature of the risk or the gradation of the risk, uh, because we use a risk matrix, three by three risk matrix to do this gradation. Uh, and then if the application is identified or the use case is identified as a high risk application, then you have to take it uh, further for evaluation. Okay, so I'm, I was surprised to hear when you said that the um, uh, people identification in public places use, using video cameras is uh, prohibited because pretty much every government is doing that. Uh, uh, every police department is doing that um, uh, in the world. So how come it's prohibited yet used by um, um, every authority in the world? Yeah, that's why that's what the UAI Act is proposing right now. Uh, but there is, of course, a fight back from the agencies that you mentioned. 
because this act is not ratified yet. It's just something that is being proposed. Um, and face scanning, for example, okay, if it's used in the right way, then you know we can use it for law enforcement, etc. But it's also a very high risk use case because what if uh, the government is against you and using it to find you where you are, right? I mean, it's uh, the risk of uh, a, a high, a powerful, uh, a powerful body misusing it is higher than the benefits, uh, at least in my opinion. And I think where we are heading from the legislation perspective is that um, you can get exceptions from the court, for example, to override this uh, restriction. So, but there, uh, at least that's what the, the legislators are trying to achieve. But of course, we have to wait for the final um, law to see what is the outcome of uh, this discussion. So what's going on with legislation right now, especially in Europe? And if you know what's, what's happening in the U.S. and you can compare, that will be useful as well. And I would like to know how do we make the legislation without slowing down the progress, uh, slow, slowing down the actual positive use of gen generative AI? Yeah, I'll try to answer as much as I can. It's a difficult topic. Um, so with the EU, the EU AI Act was supposed to be ratified this year. Um, and there was a lot of progress made. Um, but uh, just recently, the progress has been uh, hit by a little bit of setback, especially because uh, when ChatGPT got released, uh, then came the discussion about how do we govern foundational models? Like, So uh, before this, like before this hype really kicked in, like uh, the whole discussion was about AI and AI applications. Uh, but then once the foundational models came in, then the discussion completely changed and the focus started to be on the foundational models, uh, which are these large language models and, you know, image generative, uh, you know, text to image or image to image models. So and that has kind of slowed down the process a lot. Uh, and that's why, like, there will be perhaps a fourth category of foundational models. So you have the three levels of risk and then, then there might be a fourth category, which is like foundational models uh, in the law. So yeah, there is a setback right now and I don't think we will have a law by the end of this year. Um, but anyways, the goal was not to uh, start legislating the next year. The goal was to start legislating in 2025, which would then give us some time to prepare for, for this. Uh, so we need a lot of assessors as you as you kind of rightly uh, indicated, like, you know, the market, the, the, the amount of people who know how to assess the system, the knowledge is also something that needs to be developed. So I think we will have time. So whether the legislation uh, will be enforced in 25 or 26, that's the real question. But the fact is that there will be some legislation uh, coming, at least from the EU. And when the EU is legislating this, uh, this technology, then that means any supplier that wishes to uh, introduce a product in in our market, in the EU market, then they will also have to follow these uh, or at least comply with these legislations. Um, so it's an extra territorial law that is being conceived just like the GDPR. Uh, I also find uh, there is a very, um, uh, very, there are very good thinkers on uh, out there who are talking about this subject since many years, not just now. And they also say that we don't need new laws, like we could have had uh, legislation, uh, you know, we could have strengthened existing legislation to govern AI uh, use cases. So that's also an interesting perspective. And the US seems to, at least for now, take that route. So you will see that many of the states are starting to add uh, requirements into their existing laws. Uh, for example, if uh, auto insurers in I forgot the name of the state, but auto insurers in some state of the US, Texas or somewhere, uh, if they need to use, if they are going to use like uh, income and age of the driver, then they need to uh, like uh, that's actually forbidden. Yeah, you know, if they are trying to create models from the, these two characteristics or features, so th those kind of laws are starting to creep into the um, state laws in the U.S. Uh, but holistically, they are not ready to create a like a, a national law or something and. To that effect, like uh, end of October, uh, the Biden administration actually released the executive order uh, on 
you know, uh, on on and they they mandated certain institutions to come up with a report on what they think the risks are. And um, I think in like some of the institutions have like one year to produce this report. Some have three months. And once these reports are collated, I think they will be in a pro uh, they will be in a position to legislate uh, AI also in the U.S. And not to mention China is also you know like it's not new. They have uh, started their journey of le legislating uh, artificial intelligence in 2021 already. They had a, a regulation uh, for recommendation algorithms. In 2022, they had a, a, a regulation which govern the synthetically generated content. And in 23, they have also released some draft rules on generative AI. So China is also stepping up the game. Of course, critics say the 2023 regulation from China, for example, was very watered down. So initial uh, draft looked very promising and very restrictive. But then by the time the, you know, the player, the industry players got in, you know, they of course wanted less, less rules so that they can innovate. And so we see this constant, let's say, uh, battle between legislators and the industry. And it's there's no easy answer as to how to balance uh, these two uh, sides. So yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I'm also, uh, for me, uh, I think we can already take some simple measures to make AI safer and responsible. For me, that's what we can do right now. Um, and as more and more risks are evident, we should, as a society, take action on, uh, let's say, making sure that uh, those risks are contained and are uh, at least visible to the to the users and society in general. Great. So I foresee that the next year is going to be uh, the year of AI ethic assessor, um, especially if we are going to have legislation in 20, uh, in effect in 2025. So, so if uh, GDPR, I mean, when, I don't know if you remember when GDPR came in, like the first year was just consultants going around showing PowerPoints on what GDPR might look like. And nobody really took it that seriously, right? I mean, like everyone was like, yeah, something is coming in a few years and we have to get ready for that. But today, like GDPR is really uh, like, I don't think anybody has any doubt on whether they should comply or not. I mean, there are already uh, fines being uh, met, uh, like le uh, sent out and or the courts are already legislating, um, uh, you know, um, like cases. Uh, I, I just saw a case from the Netherlands where a user was able to prove that uh, a company like a internet advertising company is storing a cookie in on his computer, even though he had declined the consent for this cookie. And then the court was immediately uh, slapping a fine on this, uh, on this company too. So, I mean, so it took a while, right, before users realized what their rights are and people, companies realize what their duties are. I think we will go through a similar process um, for that. So right now, if you look at the job market, there are very few adverts for AI ethics uh, experts. I mean, it's not a very big market, but yeah, I think in the next two years, maybe not the, maybe not next year, but in the next two years, we will see more and more demand and maybe as the progress of AI is going so fast, maybe the demand for these experts will also go fast. Uh, you know, before the demand for experts will grow, uh, there is definitely a demand for the training uh, because you join any large or medium-sized corporation, you'll be trained on GDPR. There will be, uh, as part of onboarding, there'll be lots of different trainings, including GDPR. Um, but there was uh, no, so far, uh, uh, ethical use of uh, Gen AI training. And uh, if you build something like that, I'm sure it will be in demand uh, from large corporations. That, that can be a good start um, to penetrate with, the, with this idea uh, to the minds of the management teams. Yeah, just like, uh, you know, you have security training. Um... That's right, yep. At least uh, I, I heard from IKEA, for example, like this, this Swedish furniture manufacturer, which we all know of, they are planning to not only train their uh, entire staff or entire employee base on fundamentals of AI, but they're also trying to train them on responsible AI. 
Mm -hmm. And there are already courses out there. Like I think there are free courses from SAP on Open SAP. There are on on responsible AI or AI ethics. There are also courses. Um, uh, there's also the course on uh, elements of AI, for example. Like this is a famous course from the University of Helsinki. They also have a course on AI ethics, which uh, your listeners maybe or uh, viewers can actually go and um, subscribe to. It's free. All these courses are free. There's also a responsible AI course, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from Microsoft. Uh, and I think every uh, every one of these large, uh, um, you know, uh, like software or services uh, companies, they all have a free course on this topic. And for the ones who are more serious about like trying to become assessors or uh, trying to go deeper into the ontological specifications, etc., then I would recommend them to do the IEEE certified training, uh, and which is preparing you to become a certified assessor. And this is a three to six month process, so it's not a overnight uh, journey. But uh, yeah, I think this market needs more and more people who are first of all aware of what AI ethics is, and uh, and also more importantly, you know, people as you mentioned, like people who can help other companies. Uh, other enterprises and organizations um, learn about how to do responsible AI development. So, yeah, we, we will see more demand for these courses as well. Yeah. Uh, Biju, send me a few links and I'll put them in the comment uh, to the to this video uh, once it's going to be published. Uh, I think it will be useful for, uh, for the viewers. And uh, I'm sure we just scratched the surface for this big, big topic. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll continue this discussion going forward. And now I have two, my, two of my final questions. One is from my previous speaker. And this question is, uh, what's your view on the use cases where generative AI will elevate people, will allow them to do a better job, to higher paying job, and uh, make uh, their life uh, easier, but yet be more productive. So can you think of the use cases like that? And what, what's your thought on the uh, AI as the tool to elevate people professionally? Yeah, so like one real life example that I heard of, so it's not a, a like a incident that, I, that happened to somebody within my first circle of friends or colleagues, but this is coming from a friend of a colleague and he mentioned that um, a few years ago he landed a, a high paying job at a, a big five consultancy but his english skills were not that good so he couldn't communicate his thoughts uh, in english because his mother tongue wasn't english uh, and therefore he in a few months himself decided to uh, abandon this opportunity because he couldn't uh, let's say feel satisfied about his uh, work uh, and then uh, today, like he says, if he had the same kind of tools like chat GPT or, you know, these generative AI tools, he could have uh, easily fulfilled his uh, duties at this organization. So that kind of gives you a idea because sometimes people like me, like who have studied in English all my life, I mean, it's easy for me to write a very nice email. Uh, but uh, for many people around the world, I mean, this might not be the case. And I think chat GPT or these large language models will really benefit them. Um, but then, uh, as I mentioned, like uh, we in, in my organization, uh, Nordaria, we are trying to uh, improve the efficiency of um, uh, the uh, like business processes itself. So going through many clicks and, you know, if you are executing a complex workflow, this can be very frustrating for people. And, you know, like it's not adding any value to their work, their life, uh, and simplifying it using Gen AI is what we are uh, right now focused on. And this, I believe, will not only improve their productivity, but also like uh, improve their work-life balance and, uh, and you know, overall improve the satisfaction uh, for them in their work, uh, work life at least. So yeah, that's how I see the future going forward. Great. And uh, my last question is, what's your question to my next uh, guest speaker? What do you want me to ask my next guest? So I would ask them uh, if they are from a specific industry to um, like at least identify a few potential high-risk AI applications that they might want to develop 
Um, and that uh, would be a good question, like whether they even have some in mind, which they think will be very beneficial, but accompany a lot of risks for the, the subjects or the users of these applications. Awesome. Thank you very much. Bidru, I really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you very much for taking time uh, for this conversation. Really appreciate and uh, look forward uh, to continue working with you. Thank you, Ilya. And uh, wish, wish you luck in this new venture of bringing together experts and uh, you know gathering the knowledge and sharing it with your audience. So best of luck. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.